right, we're live. All right, hello everyone. Welcome to Zero Books Capital Comrades. Today we'll be continuing with our reading series of the core texts of Chinese Marxism. Uh, that is the speeches and writings of Mao Zedong, Deng Xi Jinping, Deng Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping. Really, really struggle with that one, buddy. I don't know. It's we're off to a good start. We can't pronounce his name, um, but. <laughs> Yeah, we're doing just, we're doing really well. I, I, I'm just yeah. continuing the tradition of uh, this is I'm, like I'm sorry, Tim. If you're gonna mess it up, I'm gonna make fun of you in the public in public every time. So please do, please do. <laughs> okay. Anyway, reading Dang, reading Dang. We're on volume yeah. two of Dang. We got three. We have three uh, works from the second volume. The first one is the whole party should take the overall interest into account and uh, push the uh, the economy forward. The next one is Mao Zedong thought must be correctly understood as an integral whole and on political work. We're also taking a look at Deng's speech to the UN, which had a particular, which is just a speech by chairman of the delegation of the People's Republic of China, Deng Xiaoping, at the special session of the UN General Assembly, which was in, which was April 10th. 1974. And do you just want to, sorry, guys, we're just setting up the link, so it'll just take us like two seconds before we really tune in, and that's when I, but um, mm. do you, Timothy, do you want to just mention something with the content of this? Oh, yeah. So um, the first, uh, most of the stuff from the, uh, from the collected works is just kind of going over a little bit, or it's a, a view into how China was running at the time, because I believe this is after uh, Deng was brought back to Beijing after the Cultural Revolution, and some of these cover his conflicts seemingly after his uh, fight with the with the with the four with the Gang of Four. And then in the speech, we start to say uh, Deng goes over uh, dividing up the world into the first world, the second world, and the third world, but he does does it in a different way than what most people refer to. In like the West, you'll have to hear the first world was like NATO, the second world being like the USSR and China, and the third world being the developing, the rest of the developing world. However, Deng does it differently, where the first world is the two superpowers of America and the USSR, the second world being kind of, uh, and the third world being the developing countries, Africa, Latin America, China, and the second world were the ones caught in between Okay, yeah, and we'll we'll get into that. I, I think it's interesting, actually. We're going to get into the UN speech. So the, the UN speech was a 1974 speech. Again, uh, it was given to Deng Xiaoping, to the United Nations, after he was brought out of exile in the Cultural Revolution, like, like Timothy said. Um, but, you know, in terms of what we're going to be seeing, um, you know, uh, uh, as we examine these texts going forth to about uh, 1980, obviously there's a, a progressive process whereby uh, Deng succeeds in consolidating power. Um, but, you know, uh, China is a, is a big country. Um, you know, the Chinese Communist Party is certainly chock full of, of very competent officials who cut their teeth uh, during the, the earlier civil wars, and especially in the first 10 years of, of development from 49 to 58. Um, so there's a particular confluence of events um, that allows Deng to consolidate power in China. Um, and I just want to outline um, a few of those events before we before we dig uh, sort of deeper. Um, so, uh, you know, obviously, uh, in, uh, from 67 to 76, you have the cultural revolution, uh, in China. Right. Um, and you know, uh, I, I probably don't need to, to, to belabor too much the details of the cultural revolution. I imagine it'll be somewhat familiar to most of our readers. Um, but you know, this sort of mass mobilization of, of Chinese society against, uh, ostensibly the kind of, you know, the sort of bureaucratic authoritarianism, analogous perhaps to what had, had transpired in the Soviet Union, uh, which was supposedly overtaking China. Um, again, there were there were certain good things uh, that were accomplished uh, in the Cultural Revolution, contrary maybe to how it's sometimes described in the West. Um, one thing about China today is as a very robust uh, local democracy, local elections, for example, were first held uh, during the Cultural Revolution as a, mo as a, a means of sort of dismantling um, some of the the more uh, congealed or authoritarian structures which had been established, but there also was a lot of disorder, uh, you know, and and this also additionally this touched the domain of production, 
Um, when we look back and looked at Deng's essays earlier, uh, it's very clear that he was always very cognizant of the need to develop the Chinese economy and the relationship between that, um, you know, and the acquisition of consent for the agenda uh, of the, the Chinese Communist Party. So, um, but, you know, Deng, again, had been denounced as a, a capitalist rotor, and he'd went to exile after the Cultural Revolution, which is why there's this huge gap of about 10 years between the first volume of selected works and the second volume of selected works while he was in exile. He was out like on a farm, like raising chickens. He loved to, you know, kind of drink beers and, and smoke and just chill. But he did mm -hmm. long to be back in the action. So he wrote Mao letters every couple of weeks, you know, trying to get, sorry, for some of you guys, I know this will be repetitive, but, um, but again, there was a particular confluence of events um, that allowed uh, Deng to consolidate power between uh, 1975 and 1980. Um, now, uh, Mao, in fact, throughout his career, he appointed uh, a number of successors to him. Mm -hmm. Right. So you had uh, first you had I want to say Liu Shekui or something. I double check the name. But the second one was uh, Lin Bao, and the third one was Lao and Lai. Right. Um, now uh, Lin Bao uh, died somewhat mysteriously, uh, ostensibly um, in a uh, a plane crash uh, in 1971, uh, and it was alleged by the the Chinese government that he was planning a coup against Mao. Um, mm -hmm. because of a certain rift which had developed between them at that time. Um, but there's a lot of skepticism of that official account. Um, and of course, it was convenient, the idea that he had planned to coup and was fleeing the Soviet Union because, you know, Mao was, had taken a, a, an aggressive posture toward the Soviet Union at that time. Um, Lao and Lai uh, continued to be uh, revered until the end of his life. Um, but he died, uh, I, I have to look it up, but he died of a medical condition in 1976. And there was a big outpouring of public grief in China when that mm -hmm. happened. Um, at the same time, uh, Mao died in 1976, right? So you can see that there was an acute vacuum of power, right? Um, and, you know, Deng, of course, had had, you know, he had, he had had, on one hand, he had a very illustrious career, right? We've already went through his, his successes uh, in the Civil War in China and the anti-Japanese uh, conflict and so on. Um, but at the same time, he had suffered a number of denunciations which had done damage to his reputation. Um, what worked in his favor um, in the uh, mid to late 70s was, so, so Deng was recalled, remember Deng was recalled initially from exile um, to Beijing. And this is, this is the time when he gives the speech that we're about to analyze was during his, his, his sort of first return after, you know, the end of the Cultural Revolution. Mm -hmm. And um, what, what happened was ultimately Mao, after having called Deng back because he wanted to calm the tensions of the Cultural Revolution, that was why he called Deng back because there was no mystery that Deng, you know, didn't support these things sincerely. Um, though, though it should be examined it closely. There's a level of there's you know as with all these things, there's like a level of complicity. I don't want to make it black or white, right? But right. Um, Mao basically said to you know he got a bit suspicious of Deng when Deng came back. And and by the way, this speech we're about to read was part of the reason for that suspicion because this speech attracted huge international attention, positive attention to Deng. Right. right. Mm -hmm. You see this very powerful post-colonial kind of emancipatory message in the speech, as we'll see. Yeah. Um, but Mao started to get, you know, and obviously, you know, it, it's sort of like you get to be kind of a, a showpiece, right? If you go and do these speeches to the UN, you know, um, I don't even think I have to double check. I, I don't I don't know the date. I have to double check the date at which maybe you guys can check it for me. The date at which uh, the United Nations recognized uh, China as opposed to Taiwan or the Republic of China as the official representative seat of that territory. Um, I think it may have been after uh, this speech, but in any, in any case, it was clearly a consequence of, of uh, the Sino-Soviet split and Chinese US reproachment. But anyway, so so Dang had attracted some positive attention after he returned to, to Beijing initially. And Mao, uh, he said to Dang, like, look, buddy, like, I like what you're doing, good, you know, good stuff. But, and by the way, this is a misconception about, you know, we've already went through this, but this is a misconception about, you know, the pure Mao and the, the awful Deng, right? Mao was trying to, to, to calm down the Cultural Revolution, right? And, and if we should we go and look at the history of the Cultural Revolution, Mao had subverted its, its wildest energies on several occasions prior to that. Uh, we talked about the Shanghai Commune here, right? Um, but anyway, so Mao said to him, look, like, you know, it's good. I like, I like your work. I like what you're doing. But I need you, I need you to say the Cultural Revolution is fundamentally a good thing, right? He wanted that sort of affirmation, right? That Deng was really behind him. 
And, you know, uh, and I don't know, they may have touched on the Great Leap Forward as well, but I forget all the details. But Dangy basically said, no, like, I'm not going to say that. Right. Now, remind you, this was very personal because his son um, was either was either uh, paralyzed or killed. I have to double check, but he was harmed by basically because of the Red Guards uh, in the Cultural Revolution. So this is very, very personal for Dang. Uh, and Dang said no. So he got sent back. Right. Back in exile. Right? Then Mao died. Mm -hmm. Back Mao and I died. Same year. Vacuum of power. Right. And that was what allowed Deng to come back and stage this sort of return. And, and keep in mind, there was a lot of public fatigue with the Cultural Revolution that allowed that. So, so I just want to wind up that narrative for everyone. So it's clear why, you know, because it's like, you know, anyone could, you know, you can do your job well and be good at it. But like, you know, to become the most powerful leader in a country of 600 million or whatever, you know, it's like that's that's there's a lot of contingent factors. Yeah. The stars got aligned. Right. So, um, but do we want to look at this 1974 speech um, for the delegation? It's the delegation of the People's Republic of China, Deng Xiaoping, at the special session of the UN General Assembly. And Tim, I don't know if you have some parts you want to you want to look at or maybe read from that that you thought were nice. Yeah, there are a couple of them. I have to because it's a web page. It's a little bit more annoying to find things. But let's see, where did it go? It was on the 25th of October, 1971, by the way. The official recognition as the, uh, of the People's Republic of China as the, only, as the only legitimate representative of China to the United Nations. What year was that, sorry? Um, 1971. Oh, 1971, yeah. So cause that was earlier. Yeah. So that was, after the, that was after the Nixon Mao meeting then. So this, was just, mm -hmm. but this, so this is crazy, right? Because keep in mind, this is like a big speech being made at the UN just three years after they actually got their, their seat. Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah. you know, keep that in mind. Um, yeah. Timothy, did you have some, some excerpts for that you want to look at? Yeah, there's okay. So the third paragraph starts with, uh, in this situation, okay. uh, in, mm -hmm. in this situation of great disorder under heaven, all the political forces in the world have undergone drastic division and realignment through prolonged trials of strength and struggle. A large number of Asians, Africans and Latin American countries, uh, have achieved independence one after another, and they are playing an ever greater role in international affairs. As a result of the emergence of social imperialism, socialist camp, which existed for a, a time after World War II, is no longer in existence. Owing to the law of the uneven development of capitalism, the Western imperialist bloc, too, is disintegrating. Judging from the changes in international relations, the world today actually consists of three parts, or three worlds, that are both interconnected and in contradiction to one another. The United States and the Soviet Union make up the first world. The developing countries in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and other regions make up the third world. The developed countries between the two make up the second world. These two superpowers, or the two super superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union, are vainly seeking world hegemony. Each in its own way attempts to bring the develop developing countries of Asia, Africa, and Latin America under its control, and at the same time to bully the developed countries that are not uh, their match in strength. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a very, very political uh, definition, obviously. It gets very interesting to refer to more developed countries. It's a little ambiguous to refer to more developed countries, which are not the United States and the Soviet Union and the Second World, right? You kind of wonder exactly, like, would that mean like France? Does he clarify anywhere in there? See, I'm not sure if he did, but the way I was reading it is I was kind of taking it as, yeah, he means like France and Europe. Like these are part of the, the more developed countries that are a part of it. Yeah, yeah. It's very interesting, by the way, when it comes to this, to point out that um, the idea, like a lot of people say like what we call post post-colonialism, right? Which which has a Saidian, you know, Edward Said, right? Sort of, that's kind of where the term I think comes from. I could be wrong, but that's, that's it, isn't it? Um, but, uh, a lot of people say it should be called tricontinentalism actually, because I, this idea, which I, you know, I, 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 like, I haven't studied like the genealogy of this idea, but my understanding is that this idea of Asia, Africa, Latin America, like the, you know, mm -hmm. this sort of notion of like third world resistance, um, in a Marxist vein was hashed out in 1967 in Cuba 
during a conference for called like the Tricontinental Conference. Um, and they ultimately went on to publish a magazine, I think that was related to it, which was also responsible to for drawing attention to Palestine, um, Palestinian militants, like Yasser Arafat mm -hmm. uh, for the first time. Um, so I think, I think, I don't know, like I'd have to go back and look at the specifics of this, but he seems to be, you know, it's interesting, right? Because it's quite a, you got to remember like today, it's just like, okay, yeah, like third world, Asia, Africa, Latin America, okay. But I think some of the concepts he's applying are relatively novel concepts, right? Mm -hmm. At this time, like, like right. they don't, they don't, they don't seem like they were always there as they might today. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And, and the status of, of particular countries in these categories will vary. Right. So, and you can see it, I think, very, very well represented with how the va vaccines have been developed. Right. Because, well, Latin America is, in fact, Latin America and they don't have, say, the United States uh, ex uh, expertise in how to, you know, hoard vaccines, at least. We there's still a disparity between certain countries in Latin America and others, because those have the actual, you know, uh, corporate headquarters, right, of the of the firms that that manufacture this or that, right, and you know you can see that in in this case, countries like Argentina have greatly benefited, right, from that kind of treatment. Mm -hmm. They, they, they yeah. definitely, yeah. right, right, okay. Yeah, and some of the sorry, I didn't. If you want to continue, I didn't mean no, to no, no. Off. Okay, I just mm -hmm. want to say the richer ones in Latin America. You're like with Brazil, right? Chile, yeah. right? Chile is yeah. probably the richest. Yeah. Yeah, Chile, Argentina. Mexico also in in some regards Mexico is very big just like Argentina so there are you know disparities yeah Colombia as well yeah I think quite right. relatively yeah. wealthy yeah I know in Paris there's like a lot of Colombians like everyone's from Bogota um mm. Bogota. but yeah. um but uh yeah I'm gonna re gonna I'm gonna ha tack off another paragraph here okay mm -hmm. um the two superpowers have created their own antithesis acting the way of big bullying the small the strong domineering over the weak and the rich oppressing the poor, they've aroused strong resistance among the third world and the people of the whole world. The people of Asia, Africa, and Latin America have been winning new victories in their struggles against colonialism, imperialism, and particularly hegemonism, which I assume has a Gramscian derivation, but I, I'd have to double check. Okay. The Indo-Chinese people are continuing to press forward in their struggles against US imperialist aggression and for national liberation. In the fourth Middle East war, the people of the Arab countries in Palestine broke through the control of the two superpowers and the state of no war, no peace, and won a tremendous victory uh, over the Israeli aggressors. What is that, the Fourth Middle East War? What is that? The Fourth Middle East War, what is that? Uh, I don't want to look that up. What in the God's name is that? Mm -hmm. The African people's struggle against imperialism, colonialism, and racial discrimination are developing, are developing in depth. The Republic of Guinea-Bissau uh, was born in glory amidst the, flames of, amidst the flames of armed struggle. The armed struggles and mass movements carried out by the peoples of Mozambique, Angola, Zimbabwe, Namibia, and Zania against Portuguese colonial rule and white racism in South Africa and Southern Rhodesia are surging ahead vigorously. The struggle to defend sea rights initiated by Latin American countries has grown into a worldwide struggle against the maritime hegemony of the two superpowers. The 10th Assembly of the head Heads of State and Government of the Organization of African Unity, the Four Summit Conference of the Non-Aligned Countries, and, and this is very interesting, right, because here we have the Non-Aligned Group, right, coming up, right, which I, I think, um, you know, Nasser as well as Tito were quite instrumental, um, you know, in, in developing, but the non-Soviet uh, kind of uh, uh, more amorphous socialist, socialist, uh, uh, socialist batch, right? Um, the Arab Summit Conference and the Islamic Summit Conference successfully voiced strong condemnation against imperialism, colonialism, neo-colonialism, hegemonism, Zionism, and racism demonstrating the, de the developing countries' firm will and determination to strengthen their unity and support one another in their common struggle against the hated enemies. Uh, the struggles of the Asian, African, and Latin American countries and people advancing wave upon wave have exposed the essential weakness of imperialism and particularly the superpowers, which are outwardly strong but inwardly feeble and dealt heavy blows at their wild ambitions uh, to dominate the world. Um, and then we see down here, he makes this address to the president of the United States, which is pretty, pretty ballsy, right? Do you mm -hmm. have anything there, anything from there, Timothy, you want to look at? You got anything from there? Yeah, there was a, I'm not sure. I think this is after, uh, is this before or after the bolded part where he says the danger of a new world war still exists? Yeah, this is after, people? after, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's the, just, um, 
Yeah, I think. Yeah, as Ender says, uh, the the fourth Israeli conflict, uh, mm -hmm. Arab-Israeli conflict, refers to the Yom Kippur War, where yeah. Egypt uh, tried to take a piece of the of the of the Suez Canal, right? And it seems they 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 occupied a part of it in the end. Yeah, sorry, you were saying Palestine occupied occupied part of the Egypt, Egypt. Oh, Egypt occupied part of Israel. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it seems okay. That's... Okay, yeah, good. Pretty, pretty acrimonious region, you know. Um, mm. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, if nothing else, I'll pull one here, which I think is interesting. So, so again, here he's addressing the, the president of the United States at this point. It must be pointed out that the superpower which styles itself a socialist country is by no means less proficient at neo-colonialist economic plunder. Under the name of so-called economic cooperation and international division of labor, so I suppose he's talking about the Soviet Union here. He uses high-handed measures to extort super profits in its family. In profiting at others' expense, it has gone to lengths rarely seen, even in the case of other imperialist countries. The joint enterprises it runs in some countries under the signboard of aid and support uh, are in essence copies of transnational corporations. Its usual practice is to tag a, tag a high pr price on outmoded equipment and substandard weapons and exchange them for strategic raw materials and farm produce of the developing countries. Hmm. Selling, <laughs> selling arms and ammunition in a big way it has become an international merchant of death. It often takes advantage of others' others' difficulties to press for the repayment of debts. In the recent Middle East war, it brought it bought Arab oil at a low price with a large amount of foreign exchange it earned by peddling munitions, and then sold it at a high price, making staggering profits in the twinkling of an eye. Moreover, it preaches the theory of limited sovereignty, alleges that the resources of developing countries are international property, and even asserts that the sovereignty over the natural resources is depending to a great expen extent upon the capability of utilizing these resources by the industry of the developing countries, which is funny because it sounds like John Locke, right? Um, yeah. These are these are out and out imperialist fallacies. They're even more undisguised than the so-called interdependence advertised by the other superpower, which actually means retaining the exploitative relationship. A socialist country that, it, that is true to its name ought to follow the principle of internationalism, sincerely render support and assistance to oppressed countries and nations and help them develop their national economy. But the superpower is doing exactly the opposite. This is additional proof that socialism in words, that it is socialism in words and imperialism in deeds. So he's talking about the Soviet Union. Now, mm -hmm. um, you know, to what degree this is a fair characterization? Uh, obviously, you know, um, you know, China and, and Russia were not getting along at this point. I mean, I've studied it and, you know, I think there were legitimate concerns arising from Soviet hegemony, though I do think that Mao in particular behaved in a way uh, in the early 1960s, once you know, with Khrushchev, with Khrushchev, that damaged the relationship. Very hubristic, mm -hmm. sort of. We know high policy, you know. Um, but how how fair a characterization characterization this is uh, is another. Uh, someone I like I like someone here. There you go. It's great. How how uh, how how fair a characterization this is yeah. is another question. You know, I was looking at Thomas Piketty's book, um, uh, Capital and Ideology, and he has a bunch of stats, and he notes that. Like if you look at Central Europe, for example, that the only time in its modern sort of recent or modern history that it wasn't um, paying large rents out to other countries was actually during the period of like uh, the Warsaw Pact, right? Um, so I'm not saying that the Soviet Union didn't profit from, you know, but I think maybe it's a little bit overplayed here, right? Mm -hmm. you know, this isn't, you know, this is, I don't like this, right? This violates my, I do like the speech. I think it's a nice speech. It does offend my, my left unity agenda. A little bit, but um, is there, anyone, was there something something else people wanted to single out from there going on? Yeah, uh, the thing that Ender's talking about, right? The Can Canadian mining companies, that's a particular detail here, even in North America, right? Like, they are here in Mexico, and I think about two or three weeks ago, they were actually called out publicly uh, for not paying enough taxes, right? And it, there's also this big uh, reform in the which I mentioned it last session in the in the electrical in the way of that our electrical grid is set up, where I think back in two thousand and six the president then uh, he pretty much sold the rights you know to our um, independence in in the sense of 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 electrical um, sovereign sovereignty, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Um, right now, they're fighting uh, this this same thing, like with uh, legally, right? So, 
I mean, it's still going on. And it's going on from the United States to, you know, to Latin America, Canada to Mexico, yeah. Europe to Mexico, right? Uh, Chile to Mexico also. So there's like different, you know, different contradictions going on here. Yeah, we definitely, yeah. I mean, Canada has, I was actually, it's funny because I, I spent, I did a French immersion at um, uh, UKEC, which is the University mm -hmm. University de Quebec à Chicoutimi uh, a few years ago, which is like the big, mm -hmm. it's the most prestigious school for like uh, education in like the mining fields, um, like okay. the science, mineral, like, I don't know, mineralogy, whatever the fuck you call it. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, yeah, no, Canada has a, a, it's quite a powerhouse in terms of these kind of imperialist uh, rent seeking uh, uh, mineral firms. Um, someone here is saying, sounds deep convo. What is the main idea or debate? Uh, we're reading through uh, Deng Xiaoping's writings. Uh, you know, we digress a fair bit, but we're just, um, we're discussing, I think, principally uh, the sort of transformation that he, of China that he affected um, and trying to kind of assess it uh, and, and figure out why it happened. Um, in what year did Mandela get to power? Interwagon says, uh, I feel like this is kind of the year the speech was made. I don't think so, because I think Mandela came to power about, uh, what, seven years later? Yeah, like 17 years later. So this is like... This yeah, is... 1994. Oh, okay. So actually 20 years later. Yeah. So this <laughs> is... Uh, but yeah, Mandela was a was a Maoist, right? Uh, in his uh, in his younger years. I don't know. Maybe always. I mean, he was a fan of the Spice Girls later. I know that. His favorite people were Mao and Baby Spice. Um, <laughs> that's a super good, good Canadian left. Uh, uh, but... Um, yeah, the um, uh, so let's go down a little bit. I think there's one thing that's interesting here. Um, he talks about self-reliance, which I think is really mm -hmm. important to understand about Deng. Like later in the writings, he talks about foreign capital, and he's always like very, very explicit about the need to func to you know behave in quite a delicate way uh, when it comes to um, you know permitting foreign investment, right? Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, by self-reliance, we mean that a country should should mainly rely on the strength and wisdom of its own people, control its own economic lifelines, make full use of its own resources, strive hard to increase food production, and develop its national economy step by step and in a planned way. The policy of independence and self-reliance in no way means that it should be divorced from the actual conditions of a country. Instead, it requires the distinction must be made between different circumstances, and each country should work out its own way of practicing self-reliance in the light of the specific conditions. At the present stage, a developing country that wants to develop its national economy must first of all keep its natural resources in its own hands and gradually shake off the control of foreign capital. So again, uh, strong emphasis placed on that. In many mm -hmm. developing countries, the production of raw materials accounts for a considerable proportion of the nat nat national economy. If they can take in their own hands the production, use, sale, storage, and transport of raw materials and sell them at a reasonable price on the basis of equitable trade relations in exchange for a greater number of goods needed for the growth of their industrial and agricultural production, they will then be able to resolve step by step the difficulties they're facing and pave the way for an early emergence uh, from poverty and backward backwardness. So again, here we go. If they can take in their own hands the production use, sale, storage, and transport of raw materials and sell them at reasonable prices. Right. So Deng later would would bring in foreign capital in China, but he would do so in a particularly uh, particular way. Um, so, again, he always tried to uh, really limit the capacity of foreign capital to penetrate into the pores of the overall uh, economic and political structure. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is something that's important to understand. Like maybe you can argue that Deng was a bit maybe overestimated the strength of the system they built up, you know, and the capacity of private capital to accumulate power. But you know, when he talks about these things, certainly in the late seventies, like what he says is he's like, look, he's like, we've already beaten the bourgeois, mm -hmm. you know, like they've already, we, you know, the, our political system has unfettered control, right. Um, you know, we've already nationalized production, right. So, you know, as long as we, we don't behave in a way that's really callous, right. Then we should be able to keep control of the political system and keep control of, of production, even while basically taking money from, you know, other other people are going to come in and using that to develop. And and he acknowledges very openly using cheap labor as well. And I think it's funny because people sometimes talk about that, like the great conspiracy of China, like China secretly exploits cheap labor. It's like literally in Deng's speech. He's like, yeah, well, yeah, yeah it's, it's our, publicly, you know, yeah, yeah, it says we have cheap labor. That's what we do. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so here uh, here, I just want to go down. Do you want to read that last very famous paragraph there? Uh, the second, the third last 
second Wait, last paragraph. Are you talking about the one where he talks about the cultural revolution? Um, where does or he talk? The, where, where does he talk oh, about the cultural revolution? Yeah, and the second. Oh, I was checking this one. It's the second to last. Like, it's the the last. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Second to last yeah. Do you want to read? Do you want to read that one? Yeah. 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 I'll do. The, yeah. So, uh, China is a uh, socialist country and a developing country as well. China belongs to the third world. Uh, consistently following Chairman Mao's teachings, the Chinese government and people have firmly supported all oppressed peoples and oppressed nations in the struggle to win or defend national independence, develop the national economy, and oppose colonialism, imperialism, and hegemonism. This is our bird. This is our uh, Bowden international duty. China is not a superpower, nor will she ever uh, seek to be one. What is a superpower? A superpower is an imperialist country which everywhere subjects other countries to its aggression, interference, control, subversion, or plunder, and uh, strives for world hegemony. If capitalism is restored in a big socialist country, it will inevitably become a superpower. The great proletarian cultural revolution, which has been carried out in China in recent years, and the campaign for criticizing Lin Pao and Confucius now underway throughout China are both aimed at preventing capitalist restoration and ensuring that socialist China will never change her color and will always stand by the oppressed peoples and the oppressed nations. If one day China should change her colors and turn into a superpower, if she too should play the tyrant in the world and everywhere subject others to her bullying, aggression, and exploitation, the people of the world should identify her as a social as social imperialism. Expose it. Uh, expose it. Oppose it and work together with the Chinese people to overthrow it. Yeah, which is a famous, uh, famous line. And we'll, we'll see, we'll see how that works out. Um, <laughs> but uh, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, but um, uh, I do, you know, because I do consider, I'm not like being ironic or something. Like I do consider it, China to be like, like, you know, it's the same um, diagnosis as, as uh, David Harvey or Samir Min. I do consider China to be now at a point where it could go in either direction in terms of how the economy develops. Right. Um, you know, I think Xi uh, Xi has swung a little bit more to the left than previous administrations, but I think there's still a lot to be desired there. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll we'll see what happens. Um, yeah. we, we, now's not the time to get into that too much. Uh, uh, did you have something you want to say though, Timothy? Yeah, I was just um, one thing that I was noticing uh, when we were going through this that kind of connects up with the later stuff, especially I think it was the first quotation that you did, where Deng is very consistently against an abstract treatment of Marxist-Leninism, Maoism, or and Mao Zedong thought. I don't know if it's properly MLM when Deng's talking about it, but... Um, that was actually produced, I learned this the other day, that was actually produced, the idea of MLM apparently actually was developed by The Shining Path in Peru. Mm. Oh, okay. um, yeah, I, I didn't know that, but I guess now there's people who are Maoists, so it's like I'm MLM, but... Yeah, apparently it has a doctrinal association with Shining Path. Who I learned about because they, yeah, I learned because I read this book by Julia Laval on Ma global Maoism, which is fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, the most embarrassing are the white Maoists, of course, but um, I do like the third world parts. Continue though. <laughs> yeah, it's just something I was noticing because he talks about uh, the USSR bit being an imperial, doing imperialism. Yeah. I think I think he outright says that they're imperialist, and then with other things he's saying, he's basically denying that they're socialist. They'd be doing social imperialism. But um, just hear that there's more than just the name and that just the um, just calling yourself socialist isn't enough and actually putting something into practice. And then like also like China today, at least in my view, is still kind of doing this defensive stuff in the uh, securing their own resources. Like you look at the road that they're working on or the transportation they're working on from China to Europe or to the West in general, and their work in the South China Seas is still mostly a securing effort. We're seeing it like that. So it, you can kind of see an extension of the project even today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I like this person. What, what kind of philosophy is this? Yes, uh, this book is called Zero Books Capital Comrades. <laughs> but we should have called it Zero. We should have called, called it Zero Philosophy Capital Comrades. It might have been clearer for people. Um, but um, uh, yeah, so uh, okay. So we should, I, like, we should maybe look at, and by the way, I mean, this does, this does raise, with regards to the resources thing, I mean, I couldn't, and, you know, I, like, I think that often, you know, China's so-called, like, you know, pilfering of Africa or whatever is overstated. Um, you know, it's possible that a lot of these economies will develop because of uh, the, the, the partnerships they're cultivating. But I did still, you know, I still did 
feel like there was, um, you know, when he's like, oh, well, they they trade like, what did he say? They trade like uh, uh, machinery, right? And more developed mm -hmm, stuff yeah. for like primary resources. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you do see that being part of Belt and Road as a strategy as well. So that's that's mm -hmm. somewhat ironic, right? Um, mm -hmm. But but again, like, I think, you know, what I really find about this whole thing is like, you have to, like, I think you just have to be very careful about, about terminology. And, you know, because for me, like, I don't think colonialism is the same thing as imperialism. You know what I mean? Like, like you know, like the, the, the colonialism of ancient China or the Ottoman Empire, to me, that's not the same thing as, you know, the Belgians killing killing millions of people in the Congo or something like that. Mm -hmm. right? right. You know, I think that yeah. kind of hits a different a different point. I, I mean, you, you can say that it's like it's it's connected. Right. But I think you're, you're dealing with a different kind of manifestation of that. Um, and I haven't I haven't put enough thought into it, but I would I would be. You know, in terms of the word imperialism, how that would apply to the Soviet Union, you know, I might be more inclined to say it's something more like colonialism, you know, than imperialism in terms of the the terminological differentiation I'm applying. Um, you know, because in the sense that, you know, it's not a society, um, you know, uh, organized around, you know, the injunction to valorize private capital, which I think alters like the contours of these kind of foreign interventions. Um, you know, and that's really what drove, I think, the extremity of the violences. Right, that were characteristic of you know the specifically imperialist era, right? You know, it's it's mm -hmm. it's it's a stark contrast, I think, to look at even in China, like and you know, and of course, there's lots of injustices perpetuated against you know minorities in China, but it's a stark contrast to look at um, you know the treatment of indigenous people in areas that were imperialized by the West, right? Versus like in China, where you have like majority indigenous populations in these territories, you know, local religions which continue linguistic rights and so on. Right. Um, you know, of course, the, the Xinjiang situation seems more extreme, but I mean, in general. Right. I mean, you just can't compare, you know, like the, what happened in North America to indigenous people to what's happened, you know, in China. Right. Where, again, you have all these official rights which are recognized. Right. And, and their participation in political bodies, language and so on. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's just a consequence of the shift from like pre-capitalism to to socialism. You know, and like socialism, like, you know what I mean? Because um, they didn't go through that period of, of um, sort of plateaued capitalist development, right? Yeah. You know, in an unambiguous mm -hmm. way that, that would have given license, right, to the same kind of actions. I mean, I'm over, I'm, I'm over, I'm oversimplifying, right? But I think you get my point. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let's move to, do you guys want to move to the next text? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to point out that, uh, you know, the horrors of colonialism, you know, are, are still very much alive, right? Uh, yeah. Last year, mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think, uh, no, 2019, yeah. 2012, uh, 212 activists were killed in 2019 in Latin America, right? And these activists are specifically involved in, in land struggle, right? Mm -hmm. This land that is being usually by the government taken in behalf of foreign corporations for, yeah. ex for, ex for exploitation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And yeah, it's, so, so I, I was just gonna stuff. say, I was, I was sort of just proposing a, just a, a period, like a, a periodization between colonialism yeah, and yeah. imperialism as a specifically capitalist. So I would call that imperialism, but I get your point. We use them synonymously. No, yeah, yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. I wanted to say that it's, yeah, this is how colonialism has transformed into imperialism, yeah. Okay. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, and, that, and that's, that's exactly the definition of imperialism, right? It's like, you know, like the way that, um, you know, the decline in the rate of profit, you know, at a certain level of economic density, right, causes, you know, the form formation of monopoly cartels, you know, the attempt to, uh, you know, seize resources from abroad, right, to mitigate yeah. these problems. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, but you, so, so did you have anything you want to add about that, by the way? Did you want to, is there more you want to say about that? Or? Just that uh, it's also not very clear uh, the involvement with foreign capital, because, of course, how it usually uh, is carried out is that they're killed by local gangs, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so they usually, you know, try to say that there were victims of, you know, the war against drugs and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Violent stuff, yeah, Latin America, crazy. You get into that, right? You know, and it's like, it's yes. funny, right? Because like, you know, we, I think we have this very naive conception of, not that like capitalism is always, you know, really pleasant in like North America, but I think we have this very naive, you know, notion of it. Because when we think of like, you know, um, the private sector hiring like armed security and killing protesters or whatever, you know, this has a decidedly like early 20th century, early 20th century, or, like 19th century veneer. Yeah. It. And, and, and in Latin America, it's yesterday. It's today. Yeah. 
right? <laughs> today, today. Yeah, there you go. It's pretty immediate, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, uh, so let's move because we we got forty minutes already. So let's move into um, into the three parts. So the first one, um, the whole party should take the overall interest into account and push the economy forward. Um, so I put this in here. You know, the reason this is a short one. Right. But, mm-hmm. you know, the reason I put it in here, I noticed you quoted it because this deals with the uh, this deals with Deng's overhaul of the the, the train lines. Right. Mm-hmm. The train shipping. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reason I put it in here uh, was because it was like the first big project Deng was tasked with when he came back to Beijing. Um, and this was like when the Cultural Revolution was still on. This was like before Mao's death. Mm-hmm. Um, but there had been a lot of problems, um, I guess, like um, the like the, the, I don't know, just like get into this is really crazy. But like, so in the culture revolution, a little bit like our Facebook groups, like it's like, you know, all guys having these like ridiculous fights. Uh, in the culture revolution, you had like all these gangs, mm-hmm. you know, and like they all formed and they were like little like uh, factions and they would like fight each other on the streets and stuff like that. And I guess even the, uh, the railway uh, workers had like subdivided into these groups and they were like fighting each other. I mean, I don't know all the details, but like, you know, a basic, the basic, um, uh, collapse in the organization of production that had very deleterious effects on that sector. Um, and, um, you know, shipping and so forth was hugely down. Um, and it's very, very important, right. For, for transmitting resources from one region to another. Um, so Deng was sent in and, and workplace discipline had started to fall apart, right? Like there were mm-hmm. like, uh, you know, there were, um, train conductors who were just like getting drunk and stuff like that. Um, so, uh, Deng, so this is all quite inauspicious, and, and Deng was sent in to try to rectify that. And he did so quite spectacularly, which is why, you know, that was kind of what, like, in, in the shorts, like, you got to understand, he probably wouldn't have become, been able to fill that void if he hadn't already made a very good name for himself in the short spurt when he returned back to Beijing before being sent back mm-hmm. into exile. Because he did this big UN speech, which everybody loved, of course. And he also, he took on a couple of, of problems, like the military and the trains, and he tackled them very effectively, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so let's see, let's pull this up. Yeah, I quoted that because here in Mexico, one of the big projects of the new social democratic uh, president is the Tren Maya, the Mayan train, right? Yeah. And of course, you know, as I pointed out in the comments of the the meme, uh, there is uh, a criticism from an ecological standpoint, right? Mm -hmm. But the problem here is that uh, the development of infrastructure is not going to stop as long as we have a bourgeois government. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, is it better for a socialist, your you know, uh, left wing government to um, to develop infrastructure? And you know, uh, they what what he's been doing is that he decreased the the different ports that he's been developing and so on to to factions in the military. Right. So the mar- the, the the marine, the Mexican marine, have uh, the ports now. Right. So mm-hmm. it's also a little bit like the strategy, right, of strengthening the army, so to speak, of transforming the army. So another thing that's very interesting about the Mexican government's mm-hmm. uh, actions lately is that the the corps of the army have been mobilized uh, to construction, mm-hmm. right? So yep. the airport, the new airport, which is like mm-hmm. which is uh, decried by the, by the press, by the you know. The, yeah. the right wing press usually uh, as mm-hmm. this you know pharaonic uh, you know because oh it's 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 terrible we should have instead invested in this private uh, airport over here right <laughs> yeah. uh, instead what Obrador is doing is that he has transformed the military base into a new civil uh, you know civil airport right so mm-hmm. it's in control mm-hmm. of the military it's not actual you know it's not a private airport which is what most airports actually are right. Yeah, that's interesting because in the in the Deng, you know different, but in the Deng era as well, they also uh, started shifting a lot of uh, military personnel and resources into the private sector or into yeah. services. In any case, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like you know the uh, well, to talk about this, there was there was there was sort of you know in many cases these these departments had more resources than they were using effectively. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's a lot. Yeah, of yeah, and, and then mentioned well, let's, that. Let's right? jump. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Chris, yeah. Let's jump in here. Um, mm-hmm. Do you do you guys? Uh, is there something you guys want to read out here? I have a couple couple for, uh, passages circled, but uh, I don't know if you guys want to read anything. So this essay, by the way, is called "The Whole Party Should Take the Overall Interest into Account and Push the Economy Forward," but it deals principally with the the rail situation. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, uh, I'll just 
go through a couple paragraphs here, so I'll read. Chairman Mao has said that it is necessary to make revolution, promote production and other work, and ensure preparedness in the event of war. That would be war with the Soviet Union, by the way. And in fact, Ender Wigan um, pointed out earlier, uh, he said, um, d -d 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 let's not forget, in 1974, this was during the Vietnam War. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, China had initially uh, uh, provided a large, number of, a large amount of support to Vietnam and been a real inspiration for them. Uh, as China's relationship with the Soviet Union had soured, Vietnam had, had sided with a more powerful country, the Soviet Union, um, at the, uh, you know, and China was not pleased with that. Um, so there was a brief border skirmish between them that took place, I think, mm -hmm. in 77 or 76. We'll look up the year. But, uh, and of course, uh, China, as well as the United States, ended up supporting, uh, tragically, ended up supporting uh, Pol Pot in Cambodia, right? Um, before he was in, in, in before he was uh, uh, overthrown by the the Vietnamese later. Um, but uh, yeah, just looking at this uh, here. So uh, Chairman Mao has said that it is necessary to make revolution, promote production, and other work, and ensure preparedness in the event of war. I'm told that some comrades nowadays only dare to make revolution, but not to not to promote production. They say that the former is safe, but the latter dangerous. This is utterly wrong. What is the actual situation in production? Agriculture appears to be doing comparatively well, but the per capita grain yield is only 304.5 kilograms. Grain reserves are small and the income of the peasants is pretty low. As for industry, it deserves our serious attention. Its, its existing capacity is not fully util utilized and its output last year was inadequate. This is the final year of the fourth five-year plan. And if production doesn't increase, we're sure to have difficulties in carrying out the fifth five-year plan. We must foresee that possibility and earnestly address that problem. So he's saying here that the government's credibility had actually been eroded, right? This is what mm -hmm. he's saying by the excesses of the Cultural Revolution. This is what he's right. alluding to, to the point where it would couldn't, could inhibit their ability to actually carry out economic planning, right? Mm -hmm. um, how can you give a boost to the economy? And it also shows that the weak link at the moment is the railways. If the problems in railway transport are not solved, our production schedules will be disrupted and the entire plan will be nullified. So the Central Committee is determined to solve this problem. Today, we shall issue a decision of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China on improving rail, rail work. Um, and I just wanted to look at one other paragraph. Maybe one of you guys could read for me. Do you know the paragraph on the uh, page 10 on the PDF? Um, the second paragraph, the decision of the Central Committee. Get someone? Sure, yeah. The okay. decision of the Central Committee also includes instructions on combating factionalism. Factionalism now seriously jeopardizes our overall interest. This question must be brought before all personnel and explained to them clearly as a major issue of right and wrong. It is, of, it is no use tackling specific problems unless we have first settled this general issue. Persons engaging in factional activities should be re-educated under leaders opposed. Generally speaking, such leaders can be divided into two categories. One category consists of persons, who are obsessed by factionalism, have engaged in factional activities for several years, and have lost their sense of right and wrong. For them, Marxism, Mao Zedong thought, and the Communist Party have all disappeared. They should be educated. If they correct their mistakes, then we will let bygones be bygones. But if they refuse to mend their ways, they will be sternly dealt with. The second category consists of a few bad elements. <laughs> they can be found in all lines of work, in every province and city. They fish in troubled waters by capitalizing on factionalism and undermining socialist public order and economic construction. They take advantage of the resulting confusion to speculate and profiteer, grabbing power and money. Something must be done about such people. And then he gives an example, take for instance, that ringleader in, in, Zha, in Zha Zhao, who has been creating disturbances. He is so capable that he exercises a virtual dictatorship over the place. If we don't take action against this sort of person now, how much longer are we going to wait? As I see it, we should only give him one month, that is, till the end of March, so that's nine days, but to mend his ways, if he fails to do so, and stubbornly stands in opposition to the proletariat, then his misdeeds will be treated as crimes. Yeah, and I love this. I, like, actually, a, a great movie I recommend um, if you guys 
uh, I think it's like the most acclaimed Chinese film, but the Cultural Revolution. But uh, a great movie I recommend is a movie called In the Heat of the Sun. Uh, about uh, yeah, it's it's about Yu's growing up in Beijing um, mm -hmm. in the in the during the Cultural Revolution, and I guess like their um, parents being being in the military, so they kind of like mm -hmm. their fathers are away, and they're kind of just like bumming around sort of Beijing. And the city has actually been quite emptied out because so many people have been like, you know, went to the countryside to do stuff. Um, but they are, they have a, enjoy a slightly more privilege because of their connection to public authority. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, it's a great, uh, 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 it's a great um, movie about this. And you see like, it's just like, there's this surreal scene where it's like all the, you see them under a bridge and there's like hundreds of guys like on both mm -hmm. sides of the factions in the cultural revolution. And they've all got like baseball bats and stuff. And like, you know, these kind of instruments, they got like a Jeep there some military equipment mm -hmm. and then one of them one of them walks out and he talks to the other guy and they talk for like you know two or three minutes you know and then they come back and then they're like the next scene you see they all just they decided not to fight so they're all in this bar and they're all getting drunk and there's like pictures of like Mao Zedong up on the wall <laughs> sharing their glasses and cheersing their glasses so you had like yeah, these dialectics yeah. yeah dialectics there you go yeah um but you had these uh uh by the way uh just just um by the way, uh, Jake, uh, just so you know, when we said dialectics, that was a joke, by the way. That's not our real conception of dialectics. <laughs> I, 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 I want to clarify, by the way, also because, uh, you know, I feel like you'd be at risk of, of taking that kind of thing seriously. Uh, unless I clarify otherwise. No, <laughs> that was not mean? a real interpretation of dialectics. <laughs> don't, don't take notes on that. Um, <laughs> you do two things, you put them next to each other. It's soft. That's all. It's awesome. just a mix. It's just a mix. Yin Yang dialectics. Uh, dialectics has always been there in China. Um, but um, uh, no, the uh, what you see. So you had these like you had these little uh, uh, you know sort of um, chieftains, right? Who like built up their own their own power in this context. Um, and it was interesting because like Deng always allegorizes the Cultural Revolution like feudalism, which I find really interesting, right? So like in a nineteen I'm trying to remember the year. Was it 80? And like, a, I think it's 1980. He did an interview with Oriana Falashi, like the Italian journalist. Mm -hmm. um, and he says basically that, um, you know, they say like, they say they're talking about Mao and Deng basically says, well, he says like the problem with Mao is that we did well in the beginning. He's like, but in his twilight years, he began to embrace ways of thinking that were like feudalistic and patriarchal. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, he said like, he said, like, we're a socialist country. He said, but we need to recognize that any capitalism is superior to feudalism, right? That was basically his. Uh, so sorry, Jake, I know you're more of a fan of feudalism. Um, but, um, <laughs> and, and Messian, Marxist Messianism, um, scripture. Uh, but, um, great prophet. Yeah. Uh, sorry, what? Uh, Marx, the great prophet. Yeah, Marx, the great prophet. <laughs> There's a quote in that <laughs> later. The yeah, critique of the Gotha program. The, the critique of the Gotha program. They wrote the scripture wrote exactly what what communism entails: lower stage, higher stage. Anything short of that, you know, <laughs> is an abortion. Like the scriptural approach to Marxism. Um, but um, sorry, I won't I won't digress to, to bash our viewers anymore. Um, but uh, we love them. Yeah. So so you see this link he establishes between feudalism, right, and some of these things. So it's interesting, right? If you think of the way China was like torn up by warlords. Right, you know, um, in the in the twenties and the thirties, right, prior to mm -hmm. uh, the communist victory, um, you know, you can see how there might be the temptation to make that analogy, right, between like the yeah. way people were kind of running these factions and like dividing society. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what you know. That's what that's what Deng sort of did. Is he said like the problem was you know, and even like Alberto Toscano writes about the Cultural Revolution, and he says like the problem with the Cultural Revolution was there's like this sort of emancipatory idea. But in practice, it just led to this sort of like factionalism in pursuit of petty interest, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and so the modernizing project that was initiated by the Chinese Communist Party was precisely supposed to overcome those kind of things too, right? Yeah. You know, and then it kind of sinks into them. So that's that's, you know, that's sort of the 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 message of uh, of Deng here. And he says Deng is talking about Vouch here. Yeah, I like that. That'd be good. That would be that would be like in an ideal world. Like I would just be like, what does he say here? I doubt that the, the, the ring the ringleader Vouch who's been creating disturbances. He is still <laughs> capable of the exercise of virtual dictatorship over segments of YouTube. Uh, yeah, he has until March to mend his ways. If he doesn't do so, uh, his misdeeds will be treated as crimes. I would love to. Uh, that'd be great. And I'm a nice guy, so I'm not you know no gulags. Um, but you know Vouch has till the end of March. I would like that to read. 
<laughs> to read <laughs> to read something <laughs> to read more just read something <laughs> something <laughs> I like how I, I love our uh, like you know, and I love how the group just develops these like symbolic opponents too. Like it's like whenever Dang gets on here, he's just like he's like yeah, the Gang of Four and Lin Bao. Like it's like a refrain, <laughs> you know. He's like yeah, there's some yeah. problems in production. Must be the Gang of Four and Lin Bao. Um, it's like yeah, of course we have our we have our list too. We know it. We know it's Zero Books Capital Conference. Mm -hmm. Um, which which Pamu is going to get themselves added to if they keep if they keep mm -hmm. launching these these attacks? Yeah, we'll we'll uh, we'll March sixteenth them May May sixteenth them. Yeah, we'll give them we'll give them, we'll give them an ultimatum. Um, okay, so we get to so, so that's just that just touches on on some of the. Um, I just wanted to to kind of uh, look at that. Um, the and he doesn't like he does he touch too much? Yeah, he talks a little bit here about the problems too, and I, maybe just read a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. um, do, 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 do. Here we go. Uh, there were seven. So he talks about ac uh, railway accidents. There were 755 major rail accidents last year, some of them extremely serious. There's many times greater than the figure of 88 accidents um, for 1964, the year with the lowest rate. Many of the accidents were caused by negligence, including negligence in maintaining rolling stock. This indicates that there are no proper rules and that discipline is poor. It is now time to reimpose some rules and regulations. One of the old, that's a great, that's a, that's, that should actually be the name of, of Deng, the second volume here. That'd be good. It is now time to reimpose some rules <laughs> and regulations. That'd be a good, good subtitle. Um, what, one of the old rules was that engine drivers had to bring their lunch boxes to their locomotives and were not allowed to leave the train for meals. There were good reasons for this, but now engine drivers go off to eat whenever they like. And this means the trains frequently run behind schedule. The long-standing rule prohibiting the consumption of alcohol while on duty is not strictly observed now either. If someone gets drunk and pulls the wrong switch, he can cause a collision. For these reasons, essential rules and regulations must be restored and improved, and the sense of organization and discipline enhanced. This problem concerns not only the railway departments, but the localities of other departments as well. So it makes pretty clear here that he wants to use this as a laboratory for broader kinds of uh, efforts to make production and shipping more efficient. Right? Mm -hmm. um, now, the next one we have, I think, is, is quite important, the next essay. Uh, and that is Mao Zedong thought must be correctly understood uh, as an integral whole. Uh, and I hope I hope I hope Jake's still here because I think also um, Marx Marx's thought needs to be correctly understood uh, as an integral whole, rather than just reading Wikipedia pages or taking out these individual lines, uh, you know, and treating them in this sort of religious fashion. Um, but then I think his degree is on is on you know Marx and and what is it like Christian templates vis-a-vis uh, -vis Marxism. So unsurprising in that respect. Um, so anyway, I'm going to stop now. Really, I'm done. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. OK, so uh, does someone want to read the first paragraph of that one? Sure. Um, so it says, Marxism, Leninism, and Mao Zedong thought constitute the guiding ideology of our party. Mao Zedong thought has sprung from and developed Marxism, Leninism. But Lin Biao negated Mao Zedong thought by saying that it was fully embodied in the three constantly read articles. He even severed Mao Zedong thought from Marxism-Leninism. This was a gross distortion of Mao Zedong thought and was most detrimental to the cause of the party and socialism in China and to the cause of the international communist movement. So I have a, a little you know, detail here. The three constantly read articles or the three old, uh, old articles were early political essays written by Mao Zedong before 1949. Mm -hmm. They were entitled in memory of Norman Bethune, dedicated to Norman Bethune or Bethune, uh, serve the people, written in memory of Zhang Zaid and the foolish old man who removed the mountains. The articles, said to represent the essence of Mao's ideology, extolled selflessness, hard work, and internationalism. And you know what I further read uh, down the article was that you know, speaking of, of reading Wikipedia articles, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, it can be useful. I didn't say. I just said yeah, okay, no, it can. <laughs> No, right, right. So I actually went to a secondary source that was great. I'll, I'll link it in chat. It's It was called China Posters, I think. Yeah, here it is, ChinesePosters.net, right? And yeah. so it's pretty much, right, like Wikipedia articles, but they also add the different propaganda posters that they were that they produced. So you can, you know, see how it was all illustrated, right? They also add a lot of context and um, in this case, the, the context that I'm trying to add is that Lin Biao would uh, he would say that the only thing you need to do to understand Marxism-Leninism 
and Marxism in general is to read Mao Zedong thought. And that Mao Zedong thought can be summarized in the three constantly read articles, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and this is something that this actually, and I want to say just about the three, I haven't looked through all three. I've read the one on Norman Bethune and not for a specific reason, because I want to say, so I know you're going to, you said, oh, Canada, all these bad, you know, mining companies. True. But uh, yeah. it's also true that one of the three constant, uh, one of the three constantly read articles uh, is about Norman Bethune, who was actually a Canadian doctor. Uh, and mm -hmm. he fought in the, uh, the Spanish Civil War. Um, and then he went to, uh, he went to fight with the Chinese communists, I think in the thirties. Um, mm -hmm. and he developed mobile blood transfusion units, um, which is an amazing innovation. I don't know if you guys have seen the show MASH. Um, I know yeah. of it. I haven't seen it. Yeah. yeah. So that's what they're, they're doing in that. So he developed that stuff. Um, <laughs> and, and then he died of blood poisoning and Mao, uh, wrote an essay commemorating him. And Mao's kind of starts by asking the question and he says like, what is it that, um, you know, inspires, what is it that causes someone who comes from like a background of relative privilege to come all the way across the world, you know, and put themselves at great risk, um, you know, and sacrifice themselves so selflessly, um, mm -hmm. for, you know, our struggle. Um, and at the end of the essay, he basically declares that like, you know, Norman Bethune is sort of like the, um, archetypal socialist man of the future, you know, and something that all yeah. of us should, should aspire to. Um, so this, this actually was taught obligatorily in schools, I think in China, I don't know about today, but, but for a long time it was taught obligatorily, maybe still today. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, and so if you talk to Chinese people, certainly of, uh, of a certain age, uh, they'll all, they all know who that is. Right. And then actually, even a few years ago, the conservative government mm -hmm. in Canada constructed conservative government, right? Just shows you, you know, mm -hmm. tourism is everybody's business. Uh, the conservative government, they constructed a memorial, a memorial in Canada to Norman Bethune um, to attract Chinese tourists in his hometown, which I think was Gravehurst or something like that, some shithole. Um, but, um, hey, um, hey. yeah, I mean, yeah, be, I'm from there, so I can say that. You know, okay. You um, but, uh, yeah, so uh, that that is interesting. But as regards this, yeah, one thing that, that you know, one thing that, that, um, to understand Marx and Marxism, you just need to read Mao Zedong. Yeah. Um, one thing that Deng consistently stresses is that like he, he criticizes heavily. Um, and this is what I really like about, cause I think Deng, you know, a lot of people criticize him. I think he's a pretty sophisticated reading of Marx mm -hmm. and, and, and Mao. And I'm not saying like he was like an academic, but I think he spent enough time, you know, dealing with this and, and looking at these texts. And it was important in any case for upper, upper level cadre. Um, but I think with Deng, uh, yeah, he has a very, uh, a very holistic view of the material, right? And he emphasizes repeatedly the need to look at Marx's work, you know, because that, that strongly supports, I think, his, because he wants to get, he likes early Maoist thought, but I don't think, he, I don't think he's a big fan of some of Mao's later writings. And in particular, I don't think he's a fan of efforts by certain individuals, including Mao himself, to, to sort of deify, um, to sort of deify some of mm -hmm. Mao's uh, later writings and say like, well, all the knowledge that you need is in this or that, right? And Deng's like, look, this is a study, you know, like these are very complex issues. You can't just take a, you, you can't just take a few sayings, idioms, you know, mm -hmm. and that's not enough. Um, so he consistently stresses, you know, the primacy of Marxism and, and Leninism and the need to study them. Um, but also, also early Mao, right? Because he, he always talks about the, he always talks about the good old days. Right. He's like, oh, you know, we did good. He's like, we did good until the and basically he's like, we did great until the until the great leap forward. Mm -hmm. You know, and then we had some problems and then it was like, OK, in the early 60s. But then we, you know, we did we did bad again. So he likes to stress the he likes to stress the first 10 years, especially 49 to 50. Mm -hmm. He likes to, to talk about a lot. But here we go. So, yeah, he says, um, uh, yeah, of course, just, yeah, I'm putting this stuff to Lin Bao because. He's dead. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna read a little bit here from the next yeah. page. But but the gang of four, and especially their so-called theoretician Zhang Jinghao, distorted and, and adulterated Mao Zedong thought. They tried to fool people or intimidate them by quoting a phrase or two from Comrade Mao Zedong. We need to have a true grasp of Mao Zedong thought and correct understanding of it as an integral whole, even when dealing with a particular sphere or one aspect of a particular problem. Take, for example, the question of the intellectuals, which pertains to a specific sphere. 
Comrade Mao Zedong always attached importance to the role of the intellectuals, at the same time stressing they should earnestly remold the world outlook. <laughs> I love that. He did this both for the good of the intellectuals themselves and for the purpose of better mobilizing their energies, releasing their talents and enabling them to serve the socialist cause better. But the Gang of Four indiscriminately labeled all intellectuals the stinking number nine and asserted that it was a chairman that it was Chairman Mao who so named them. We should admit that at one time Comrade Mao Zedong treated the intellectuals as part of the bourgeoisie, but we should no longer do so. Comrade Mao Zedong did value the role of the intellectuals in the whole process of revolution and construction. To counter the slander spread by the Gang of Four, he declared in 1975, we can't do without number nine. Why does this come from? Where does number nine come from? What is that? What yeah, is it comes from the Mongols, actually. The, oh, the really? Mongols divided, yeah, the Mongols divided the Chinese into 10 castes. Let me look them up. So I can list them. Uh, Thinking number nine. It's so okay. Here it is. The term originated during the Yuan Dynasty, where the Mongol conquerors identified ten castes of Chinese: Bur bureaucrats, officials, Buddhist Buddhist monks, Taoist priests, physicians, workers, hunters, prostitutes, ninth, Confucian scholars, and finally beggars, with only beggars at the statues below the intellectuals. So, you know, yeah, it's funny that, that the government, you know, took this from the, from like conquerors, you know, from without and yeah. reapplied it within it's, well, I think the it's Mongols telling, big, I think, I think the Mongols had a big influence on the, I, I, someone was explaining that to me the other day, like what a big influence it had on organization. I forget all the details, but anyway, it had, a, it, you know, that was absorbed. That's all I want to say in many ways. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I'm just going to read a little down. It is a consistent principle of Mao Zedong thought that the people are the force that propels history forward. Being a great Marxist, comrade Mao Zedong reportedly spoke out against inappropriate and unscientific assessments of himself. And on many occasions, he taught us what the correct relationship should be between the people and leaders. Mao Zedong thought has developed Marxist-Leninism in many spheres, not just in some individual aspects. It constitutes an integral system and is a further development of Marxism. Um, someone want to read the underlined part in the next page? <laughs> Sure. Uh, our aim, right? Yeah. Yeah. Our aim is to uh, create. You can, you can, you can maybe, you can maybe note that's a quote by Mao, by the way, from 1957. Yeah. 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 Uh, so he said, it says later, comrade Mao Zedong's theory of bodybuilding was developed further. In 1957, he summed up our aim as follows Our aim is to create a political situation in which we have both centralism and democracy, both discipline and freedom, both unity of will and personal ease of mind and liveliness. And thus, to promote our socialist revolution and socialist construction, make it easier to overcome difficulties, build a modern industry and modern agriculture more rapidly, and make our party and state more secure and better able to weather storm and stress. I remember that he that we read something, you know, uh, almost like this when we were reading Mao, right? When he's yeah. uh, clarifying on the on on what it means, for example, right, to have discipline and freedom, right? That right that there is no freedom. Right, without the discipline. Yeah, yeah. Well, I like to just the fact that, like, you know, like Mao has, I think he now, in, even in English, he has like 12 volumes of select giant volumes of like, like mm -hmm. selected works or collected works or something. Um, I mean, I know, I'm sure like Deng had something like this because I know in, um, now he probably knew Mao's stuff really well because he'd like read all the, you know, communiques over the years and everything and that would help. Yeah. But I'm sure he also had, I know in the Soviet Union there was a guy and his job was he just put, he put like, uh, Zizek has talked about this, he put like, mm -hmm. um, quotes by uh, Lenin in, on cue cards and he organized them so that if they had any policy, he could like pull out this quote by Lenin and they could just use that to support whatever policy they had. So they're like, you know, okay, we're going to liberalize the economy, pull out that card. We're going to not liberalize the economy, pull out the other card. Um, <laughs> so I'm sure I, I, Zizek said, you know, this is my real hero of the Soviet Union, I mean, even more than Stalin, you know. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm sure that there was like a Mao quote guy. You know, like the, mm -hmm. the, I'm sure they have people who are good for like quote mining, you know, because it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to synthesize. <laughs> but I do think if you have a good enough handle on it, you can use it to justify any policy, surely. Um, yeah. yeah. Which is to say, which is only to say that, I mean, I do think that it's a legitimate use of, of Mao Zedong thought. I just also think that Mao Zedong thought is something that's so amorphous that it's like, you know, <clears throat> the definition of what a legitimate use is, you know, there, there are different different ways that can go. Right, and we need to understand that when we're quoting a particular 
uh, passage of Mao, right, we're trying to refer to the historical period in, in which he speaks, right? If yeah. the the if the uh, if the application of the of the analysis we're trying to to you know to to call upon doesn't work out, well, that's on us, right? Part of the process. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I do think it's interesting, right? Because like as regards this, like I do think, I think you know I would say like er, like early like low Maoism is like which is the most sophisticated Maoism is like mm -hmm. more sophisticated than Deng's and innovative than Deng's ideas. But I do think that if you look at high Maoism and sort of like the, how it had developed, I think Deng's interpretation is more interesting than that, you know, which sort of just progresses towards like, you know, kind of deification. I think his renewal of Marx, his interest in development of productive forces, locating that in the, as the principal contradiction and so on, which, by the way, I actually never read. But then I was going through because I assumed I actually deduced that the productive forces as principal contradiction. But then today I was reading and he does actually say that. As well, mm -hmm. so I was glad that I, I I I thought I wasn't sure if that was my interpretation or but but he does actually say it. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna read down here a little bit. Um, yeah. So here we get the famous seek truth from facts, following the mass yeah. line, uh, and trusting the masses. So here he's he's talking about good things to do. Follow the mass line and trust the masses. Acting on the four character slogan um, of comrade Mao Zedong, who wrote for the Central Party School in Yunnan. Seek truth from facts. It seems to me to be the call for the three honests, the Deccan Oilfield world's ex exhortation to be an honest person, honest in word and honest in deed, is identical with seeking truth from facts. I think the principle of following the mass line and seeking truth from facts are of fundamental importance in the style of work advocated by Mao Zedong. Um, so a lot of Deng's work kind of had this idea of like, let's stop, like, let's stop with the self delusion. Let's stop saying we're the most developed country in the world. You know, let's stop, um, you know, trying to perpetuate these ideological designs, which are quite out of reality, quite out of out of pace with the reality of, of production and people's daily lives, you know, and just be honest about how messed up the, our state is. Right. So you, you can understand why it did. It was a bit tricky for him to to push this agenda because it was also, you know, at the start, like when it when it when it produced certain results, it was easier for people to get behind it. But at the start, it seemed like it was repudiating a lot of what had been done. Mm -hmm. Right in the past ten years, so uh, he had to pit himself against a lot of people, right? And he had to—he was offering a vision that was, in some respects, quite cynical about the previous decade, right? And there were people who didn't want to accept that, right? Um, so it was a uh, interesting kind of thing. And what do we have here? Uh, wait, did I pass through the? Is that it? Do, do, yeah. Okay. So, uh, and then finally. When the Gang of Four was wrecking the party, the overwhelming majority of the people, one can say 99% of our cadres, party members and people generally, were deeply disturbed. We have such fine mm -hmm. cadres, such fine party members, and such a fine people, with such a high level of political consciousness and such boundless confidence in the cause of the party. So again, you see this, this is, he wants to criticize like what happened, but then he's also very much like, you know, he knows he's smart enough, right? Where he's like, he's like, mm -hmm. yeah, what happens awful? He's like, but I know 99% of you didn't support it. I know that. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that Mao choose, didn't support right? it. Yeah, I know that Mao yeah. didn't support it. So, you know, again, like he wants to criticize the past decade, but he also wants to present it as a period more so, much more so than it actually was, by the way, uh, in which a few, you know, particularly sleazy or corrupt individuals, you know, seized control of society and directed it. Right. I mean, in mm -hmm. fact, in fact, complicity is much broader. I mean, you know, we can't, if you talk about the persecutions of the Cultural Revolution, I mean, Dang is guilty too, you know, down the line. Right. Right? So it's not, it's not like, you know, and, and, and by the way, and it's not even like there also were constructive mobilizations, you know, because of the cultural revolution, you know, I'm not saying it wasn't the main good. Right. But it just means an enormously complex, complex thing that involved a huge amount of people in the society. And I think there's not a real will to confront it or discuss it in a lot of ways because it's such a, it's such a, you know, like just people in their own communities, like taking other people out and publicly humiliating them, you know, holding their face up to flames, you know, like an instrument. You know, it's like even to go back to that and to explore the guilt is is very divisive. You know, and China never really did that, right? You know, they just said always oh, those those guys. You know, mm -hmm. right? Um, so again, yeah. without without saying everything that happens wrong, I'm just saying China never went into that. You know, they they were like, let's just push ahead. You know, there was never really any any reconciliation process for that. Um, but you know, I mean, it's complicated. 
if you were to say like, oh, the culture evolution, we need to get the people who are so bad and responsible, you know, you're also rejecting some of the optimistic uh, aspects of it, right? And the way in which it was, in some respects, a Marxist initiative, mm -hmm. right? You know, to to push the country to a different stage of consciousness. So um, I don't know. I think they did. I mean, I think it's fine. Like, I just think it's, you know, I think Deng was just, let's just turn the page, you know? Yeah, we, we can't... Uh, of I think it's important to to be able to, you know, recognize what the, you know the facts for what they were, but at the same time we are enslaved to to the past, right? We were not supposed to just you know say, oh, there was a mistake that was made, thus the entire project should be shut down, right? Um, I think that a lot of politicians here in Mexico still believe that, because while they they drift from party to party and struggle against uh international imperialism they still try they still you know go and try to legislate you know fairly and so on mm. and and <clears throat> i can tell you that there, there are a lot of of parties in mexico that have a right-wing ideology and i have uh, you know i've met some political actors that some of them have been in, in it just for their own self-interest and you can tell right of course and there are some who are just, you know, idealistic. And they tell yeah. you, right, like, I am affiliated with this party because at one point they tried to carry out the revolution, right? And mm -hmm. for me, it's still alive. And, of course, I personally don't agree with that position, mm -hmm. right? I think I think we need to actualize, right, our, our personal standing and so on. But I can see, you know, how, the, how they, how there's, there's you know, there's, there's a, a sense of direction that one can get from from the from the you know from taking the positive of, of from the past right not just the negative mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah um <clears throat> no for sure and and that's you know when he says like 70 percent positive 30 percent negative about mal right which by the way he apparently took from mal himself he said, I yeah, yeah 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 he says yeah, that he said 70 percent positive 30 percent negative who knows mm -hmm. but when he takes that he's walking a fine line between saying he did enough negative so as to permit himself to put forth a new agenda while still mm -hmm. not divorcing himself from the legit like the legitimacy associated with that legacy of governance right mm -hmm. so it's a very delicate it's a very de delicate act uh uh balancing act um let's push on to the last one and by the way this is on political work and i want to talk just quickly about um we have uh at this time um by the way uh one of the things that they were opposing here which I wanted to bring up. Um, oh, there were such good essays. Some of them we didn't we didn't even get to. Um, that was this is such a great section, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But so here's there's a, there's a part where so by the way one of the things that uh, if you look up what are the the uh, so what are the two whatevers if you see this just just Google it yeah. for a sec see yeah, two yeah. whatevers. I have I have something on the two waterers. Yeah, you want to read that? Yeah, yeah. It's um. Mm, yeah, the two waterers uh refers to the statement that we will resol resolutely uphold whatever policy decisions Chairman Mao made, and unswervingly follow whatever instructions Chairman Mao gave. Right. This statement was contained in a joint editorial entitled Study the Documents Well and Grasp the Key Link, um, published by the journal Red Flag and the PLA Daily. It was advocated by the Communist uh, Party of China's chairman, Hua Wofeng, who was Mao's successor, who had earlier ended the Cultural Revolution and arrested the Gang of Four. However, this policy proved unpopular with Deng Xiaoping and other party leaders advocating market reform. It proved a trigger for Deng's maneuver in 1978 to gain control of economic policy in China and led eventually to Hua being demoted from the party leadership in 1980. The coalition of Hua's political supporters bearing the name of the whatever faction also lost its power after Deng's political maneuver. Wang Dongzheng, Xi Tengkui, Wu De, and Shen Jilian, the so-called Little Gang of Four, were relieved of all the party and state posts during the fifth plenum of the Central Committee of the CCP, the 23rd to 29th of, of February, 
Yeah. So there was a big, there was like a power struggle there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Hu Gao Feng, who I think, if I'm not mistaken, he was like, was he like a school teacher? Let me double check. Um, b -b 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 you want to um, a popular local administrator, uh, public security. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. I read it. I was, I, I forgot all the details, but he was, um, <clears throat> yeah. So he was sort of like considered like the continuity candidate, like with Mao after yeah. that candidate. <laughs> I don't know. And, um, <laughs> sure, like, man. yeah. And, uh, he, and by the way, interesting thing about Deng, he never controlled the actual technical top office right, of China. But, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so uh, there was like a struggle between Hu Gaofeng and Deng Xiaoping um, in the latter part of the 70s. Um, but Deng outmaneuvered Hua uh, mm -hmm. and um, uh, took power uh, in, he, he got rid of him and his supporters in 1980, right? But they were allowed to, they were allowed to go into retirement peacefully, which was, yeah, 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 I read that uh, one of them died of pancreatic cancer, like in the nineties, for example. Right? Yeah, yeah. In Shanghai. Yeah. So just, just you know, it was not as violent as some of the earlier stuff in the Cultural Revolution, which itself was not nearly as violent as like the Stalinist repressions or anything like that. So you see the yeah. different, different kind of contours of Chinese society. Um, but like the big battle was between because they both had like their favorite, their expressions, you know, mm -hmm. like Hua and Deng both had like their expressions. So like. Yeah, uh, Wa was really about the the two whatevers, which is uh, you know uphold Chairman Mao's thought, you know, unswervingly his directions. Um, and for for Dang, this was like kind of offensive because he's really against this like idolatry, you know. And mm -hmm. he was like, we shouldn't make a policy that's just like follow whatever that guy said. Like that's dumb. Yeah. Like you know that's not a proper you know this is what you call like feudal thinking, right? Like mm -hmm. making someone into like a demigod. Um, <clears throat> so Dang's big thing, which he had was the the four modernizations um which you will i mean i have them here i wrote it down um yeah so the four modernizations which which are elaborated we'll actually get into them more uh, in the next week but just very very quick here uh mao zedong is said that is necessary to make the past serve the present to make foreign things serve china to let a hundred flowers bloom and to weed through the old to bring forth the new right um and then he adds here uh, like he says, the four modernizations also involve class struggle, the struggle for produ production and scientific experimentation. And the last component, which people have been afraid to discuss, um, is that we should hold high the banner of Mao Zedong thought, uh, and then we should study it and apply it as a system. Um, so those are, we'll get more into that uh, next week, but, but you can see that the basic vision, um, that they had with, with you know, you can see why Deng was able to maneuver a well, Right, because Deng was putting forth a very descriptive vision of how they were going to transform Chinese. Like, this is what we're going to do. We're going to modernize it. We're going to get it going. Get everything going. Productive forces. You know, get this country in shape. And there was a big thirst for that kind of message. Mm -hmm. um, and while I was saying like one swervingly follow Mao, and people were like, "Yeah, that's your. That's yeah. what you got." Like, do you know, like that? What does that even mean? <laughs> like, yeah. Because the truth is, Wa was actually liberalizing certain aspects of the economy as well. So it's not. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm saying Deng was very good. What you see here is Deng was very good at like selling his own message, mm -hmm. right? And you can see that in all these essays. He's got a, you know, this is the thing. He's got a clear message, right? Yeah. I mean, as clear as it could be given the bureaucratic tangles, but he's got a clear message. You know, look, Mao was, and, and by the way, in the same essay, we can see, he says, uh, he said that if one's work was rated as consisting 70% of achievements and 30% of mistakes, that'd be quite all right. And that he himself would be very happy and satisfied if future generations could give him this 70, 30 rating after his death. And uh, <clears throat> by the way, I don't think that he ever actually said 70, 30. I think it's a little, I don't think he, Dang actually says that. I think he kind of, you know, he alludes to it, right? Cause he says, oh, he said that if- mm -hmm. You mean Mao? Yeah. Right. No, Dang, yeah. Dang doesn't say the 70, 30. He doesn't put it in his own mouth. Mm -hmm. okay. I think he said, if Mao said that he would be happy or something, but, but the message mm -hmm. is clear anyway. Um, but <clears throat> the point is Dang had a very defined message. You know, he's like, Mao was, he, he, he's quite coherent, right? He was like, Mao was 70% good, 30% bad. China was good. China's good. Everything's good. Greatly forward. That's a problem. Cultural revolution. That's a problem. Let's get things going. Right. Mm -hmm. Let's get, get things modernized. And, 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 you know, it's a message. It's consistent. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. You know, and it was a very effective message because it stayed within the dominant bureaucratic and political culture. 
but it also was bold, you know, and transformative, right? Um, so that's what appealed to people. I'm not saying it's all right, but <clears throat> what I'm saying is at the level of communication, you can see that WA didn't, you know, didn't succeed in the same way. But now let's 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 go. We gotta we gotta let's get to on political work. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to go over that with the I think that's important with the the two whatever yeah, yeah. on modernization. Yeah, yeah. I think on political work will you know it'll drive exactly where we're going, where we're going. Yeah. So uh, on political work, he goes through the four points that he wants to discuss on mm -hmm. politics. Um, so the the first is tell me guys what's the first what's the first point. Uh, first, about seeking truth from facts. Got to seek the truth from the facts. Wonderfully mm -hmm. uh, descriptive. Um, so uh, he criticizes here a little bit like the uh, the other side. In essence, their view is that one need only parrot what was said by Marx, Lenin, and comrade Mao Zedong. That it is enough mm -hmm. to reproduce their words mechanically. According to them, to do otherwise is to go against Marxist Leninism and Mao Zedong thought and against the guidelines of the Central Committee. This issue they have raised is no minor one. For it involves our general approach to Marxist Leninism and Mao Zedong thought. Um, does someone want to read the paragraph beginning with ever since on, sure. on page 89 of the PDF? Yeah. Ever since the time comrade Mao Zedong joined the communist movement and helped to found our party, he always conducted investigations and studies of the objective social conditions and urged others to do likewise. He always fought resolutely against the erroneous tendency to the divorce theory from practice and to act unrealistically, according to wishful thinking, or mechanically, according to books and instructions from above, regardless of the actual conditions. In 1929, in the resolution he drafted for the Gushian meeting, he sharply opposed subjectivism in the guidance of work, pointing out this would inevitably result either in opportunism or in putschism. In 1930, he wrote the essay Oppose Book Worship, which, in which he advanced the scientific thesis, no investigation, no right to speak. He firmly opposed the misguided mentality of those who, in discussions within the communist body, could not open their mouths without citing a book, as if whatever was written in a book was right. Comrade Mao Zedong said, and he, you know, uh, that he quotes someone immediately, to carry out a directive of, high, of a higher organ blindly and seemingly without any disagreement is not re really to carry it out, but it is the most artful way of opposing or sabotaging it. He also stated, when we say Marxism is correct, it is certainly not because Marx was a prophet, but because his theory has been proved correct in our practice and in our struggle. We need Marxism in our struggle. In our acceptance of this theory, no such formalistic or mystical notion as that of prophecy ever enters our minds. Uh, yeah, the depth of the irony of the fact that, yeah, he's like, don't, <laughs> I mean, that's just great. And really, like, I, I was thinking, you know, of, of trying to get, like, a smaller collection of Deng's works put out in English, like, mm -hmm. with a nice forward, like the Mao one. Like trying to put, put approach a publisher to do that, um, mm -hmm. but that would be actually just occurred to me that'd be a great thing to highlight because it's so ironic, right? He's like, yeah, people say like uh, Mao says don't don't worship books. Next thing is a quote, right? Like just the fact of quoting someone, quoting someone from a book to demonstrate that you shouldn't worship books is amazing. Yeah, I mean like, and it just really ca it really captures. I also think like it also captures like the discreet humor that frankly runs through a lot of like an irony that runs through like a lot of Deng's essays. I don't know if you guys detect that a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. I mean, it comes across even English. There is this, this kind of like, there is this like low key humor mm -hmm. in the, you know, or like, I don't know. Do you know what I mean, Timothy? Are you yeah, 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 yeah. No, you pick up on it. It's like, oh, he's here's a little joke, a little jab back and forth. Yeah, and, yeah. No, it's, it's good, it's good. I like, I like the way that Deng writes a lot of the time. I mean, a lot, some, you know, sometimes it goes on a bit, but he is funny. Yeah, Deng, 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 uh, and we should add Deng and whoever, you know, whatever unnamed individuals were helping craft these things as well. Um, so uh, second, the new historical conditions. Um, so he talks a little bit here about the army. Now he went through, he actually massively reorganized the army, by the way, because there were, he thought there were too many people and there wasn't modernized enough equipment uh, and they weren't mm -hmm. being drilled enough. So he reduced the number of people and reduced like the level, the number of people in oversight. Um, so he talks a little bit here. One of the big things here, the three main rules of discipline and the eight points of attention formulated by Mao varied in their specific content according to the circumstances. 
Um, at first, he laid down three rules of discipline and then six points for attention. Later, he made uh, <clears throat> some changes were made to the three rules, and he goes on and on about this. But the point of, of actually discussing that seems just to be to, to clarify that you know Mao actually self revised his own ideas depending on the period. So how could we not continue to revise Mao's ideas, right? If we are not, if the period changes, like how could we just take something he wrote and treat it as like this timeless, you know, mm -hmm. pr like you know, piece of scripture, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he made the uh, point very explicitly in the in the first part, or the yeah, which was the just uh, from facts you get truth, where he goes in and saying we need to adapt. I don't know if he quoted it directly, but we need to obviously understand Mao Zedong thought, but we have to actually go to reality. And with that, the theory will get altered. Is it, there's a there's a two way movement. Yeah, yeah, and I like I like his thing from when he cites the uh, three main rules of discipline and the eight points of attention. Take the rule, turn in everything captured. For example, at present there can be no question about what to do with captured articles since we are not fighting a war. So we have to consider how to act in the spirit of this rule under the new historical conditions. Another and like another funny. Uh, that's also another like sly bit of humor. Like mm -hmm. again, even like the idea we have to they have to figure out how to function in the spirit of this role, which just has no legit like no relationship really to their actual circumstances. So again, right. he's kind of he's kind of toying with like the um, the sort of quasi deification, you mm -hmm. know, that he seems to advocate, which is not a real deification, but you know, it's like we have to figure out how to act in the spirit of this role that just it doesn't pertain to our situation at all. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um no more bathing with women. Instead, or you can bathe with women now, but uh, you have to treat them well. Is that what are you referring to right now? Oh, no, that's, says, one uh, the, that's one of yeah, the points. Oh, yeah, is that one of them? Okay, wait. Yeah, no, uh, it's um, oh, yeah, do not take it's do not bathe within sight of women it was changed to do not take liberties with women. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, okay, great. Put I back see. the doors you have taken down for bedboards. And put back the straw you have used for betting. Replaced by do not hit or swear at people. I, and I just love the way this stuff, like, you know, it's like I think it's so amazing how in a like in an environment that was quite futile, like you know, Marxism. It seems like it was kind of like had to become kind of a like religion to articulate itself. Yeah. But then it creates yeah. all these. It kind of creates problems when you're like trying to, when the society becomes more developed and you're trying to move forward, you mm -hmm. know. But I think it's almost like a condition of its reception. At, in that context. So it's very complicated. Um, okay. So yeah, our revolutionary teachers, Marx, Lenin, and Comrade Mao always stress the importance of concrete historical conditions. They need to study those of both the past and the present in order to ascertain objective laws to help us guide the revolution. To ignore the new historical conditions is to cut things off from their historical context, to divorce oneself from reality, and to abandon dialectics for metaphysics. By the way, if anyone has something they want to, if anyone has a passage they want to flag, um, just let me know. Third, the question of de deconstruction and construction. Um, wait, okay. Okay, so what was, let me just, what was that one exactly? Uh, destruction means exposing and criticizing in depth the Gang of Four and collaterally Lin Bao so as to limit, eliminate their pernicious influence. Construction means understanding Mao Zedong thought correctly and as integral whole and restoring and carrying forward under the new historical conditions the fine tradition. Okay, so yeah, um, so he's t saying like what I'm against and what I'm for, right? Mm -hmm. um, he really yeah. goes after the gang of four in this one. Well, yeah, you know what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, and and I should say, by the way, uh, since since Ma the the essay we did, Mao Zedong thought must be correctly understood as a whole. This is uh, Deng's back in um, back in Beijing, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and this one in 78 in political work, he would, he would sort of get, he, you know, in 78 to 80, he would, he took the top place um, unambiguously. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the Gang of Four was already, was already gone, by the way, when he's saying this. And mm -hmm. so was Lin Bao. Like that had happened like yeah. two, and, two and seven years earlier. So um, he's not really criticizing them as much as he's criticizing like Hao Gaofeng and people like that. But, but he just, yeah. he can't, he, he's not saying them. Oh yeah, it, it's. I, I think it's more of a. He's making a point and using these as a concrete example of something he's going after. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I think it, I think it actually refers to the to the historical persecution that that you know uh, the May sixteenth, uh, the May sixteeners. I don't know if you if you know what I'm talking about. Was that uh, the? But... Uh... One second. Mm -hmm. So okay, so the May May sixteenth elements were named after the so-called May sixteenth Army Corps ultra-left Red Guards in Beijing, 
during okay. the early years of the Cultural Revolution, who targeted Zhao and Lai with the backing of Jiang King. Jiang King being the, ex uh, the last wife of Mao, right? Yeah. The name came from a May 16th notice, which Mao Zedong partially wrote and edited. However, Mao was concerned with its radicalism. So in late 1967, the group was outlawed on conspiracy and anarchism charges following the arrest of the most of most cultural revolution group members, except Yang King. A nationwide campaign was later launched to liquidate May 16th elements, which ironically created more chaos and anarchy. Countless innocent people were accused of being May 16th elements and ruthlessly persecuted. According to one source, in the province of Yangzhou alone, more than 130,000 May 16th elements were ferreted out and more than 6,000 either died or suffered permanent permanent injuries. Okay, yeah, crazy, crazy stuff, right? Yeah. Um, so let's push through a little. We got fourth about setting an example. So this is the last point he brings up in on political mm -hmm. work. Um, <clears throat> so when we, when we say we should be strict in running an army, we mean, first of all, being strict with the leading bodies and senior cadres. Senior cadres must be exemplary in acting on the fundamental principles of the three do's and three don'ts. And I do have at least the three don'ts here. Don't mm -hmm. pick on others for their faults. Don't put labels on people and don't use the big stick. Uh, do you have, do you have the three do's? I don't even know. Mm, let's see. I love all these lists you got to keep track of. Like I need like, I need like a bookmarks of like the 10 lists. <laughs> That I have to go through. It's amazing. Oh, Jesus. The I, only I, I would I say you don't need you, you can't use Wikipedia to read oh. to read to read Marx, but I do think Wikipedia, I'm not gonna say it's adequate, but it is a lot more helpful with Mao Zedong thought and his successors than it is with Marx. But a consequence of their kind of deterministic list-based ordering of so many things. Um, okay, so I found a book called the three these do's and three don'ts principles of the party, right? Or no, okay. it's it's a uh, okay, whatever. In the abstract says the party constitution stipulates that the entire party membership should practice Marxism and not revisionism, should unite and not split, and should be open and above board and not in intrigue and conspire. The most basic of the three do's and three don'ts principles as set forth by Chairman Mao is that we must practice Marxism and not revisionism. Okay, okay. Um so, so did you have the list there? Sorry, did you just read the three do's? No, no, no. I couldn't find the list, right? This is an abstract of an article about them. And, you know, that's what the abstract says. So I think it's not the list, but it's at least some guidance, right? And what it's about. I'm trying to find okay. the, the... Yeah, I mean, I I'm sure I can. The, uh, <clears throat> the three and eight. I'm not getting the three and three. Yeah. The three do's. Yeah, there's like all this stuff on them, but no one wants to... <laughs> Yeah, I know, right? No one wants to say what they actually are. What, what are, the, what are the, does one of the three do's never talk about the three do's? Like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, do we have it? CLG editors notes. Do we have this? I like, you know, I know it seems kind of clownish that we don't have this stuff written down in advance. But for the love of God, t I got to tell you to the audience, there's a lot of, a lot of random lists in this. So, oh yeah, yeah, that. like we have a lot of stuff right now written out. Yeah, in I've got like five now. lists already bookmarked. Yeah. Yeah, uh, three do's and three don'ts. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, here we go. Wait. Oh, I got it. I got it. I got it. Yeah, yeah. Practice Marxism and not revisionism. Unite and don't split. Be open and above yeah. board, and don't yeah. intrigue and conspire. Yeah, that's what During, I said. Directed against. Oh, is that exactly what you said? Okay, well, directed yeah. against the conspiratorial activities of Lin Bao and others. They were formulated by Mao Zedong and talks with the leading comrades of various localities during the inspection tour of southern China in mid-August to September 12, 1971. And that was the year, if you remember, <clears throat> in which Lin uh, died. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, anyway, he's just criticizing, like, they must, what is they, he's talking about uh, comrades doing logistical work. They must be honest yeah. and upfront and perform their duties and become red managers. They must, <clears throat> they must be of scrupulous integrity in financial affairs and combat any violation of the rules, graft, and all backdoor deals. Uh, red managers, uh, very good. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah. yeah, it's funny. Um, do, 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 do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he said we should take Mao Zedong and Lao and Lai as their models and pass on their experience and help and guide the young uh, and middle aged. Um, yeah, if I for one believe that after this conference, political work throughout the army is sure to improve and that the fine traditions of our party and army fostered by comrade Mao Zedong will be carried forward. 
So I think that's good. There we go. I think we got, I think we got a lot of stuff today, but uh, I think we got through it. Um, <laughs> I like this. <laughs> it's some saying. It, it it is it is a thing. It exists. It depends on your definition of exist. Depends on your definition <laughs> of marketing. Yeah. Um, so uh, <clears throat> here we go. Um, for the next week, I I selected three essays. By the way, no additional, you know, junk. Um, I selected three essays for you guys. Let me just uh, mm -hmm. pull it up here. So I got um, the first one is uphold the four cardinal principles, and that's from 1979. Uh, the second one is we can develop a market economy under socialism from 1979, um, which I'd like to contrast with some of Mendel's uh, Ernest Mendel's writings on, on this related, which I think agree with uh, uh, Deng's analysis quite 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 close. Um, and the third one is the present situation and the task before us, which is written in January 16th, 1980, uh, to sort of sum up what had been accomplished in the past few years and project goals for the 1980s. Right. Um, so, you know, this, these are those, are, the, are you good for those three for the next, uh, what's the third one? The third one is, uh, the present situation and the task and the task before, before us. us. Yeah. Okay. Got it. The second one's actually an interview with, uh, a guy named Gibney, I guess they didn't Gibney, bother. Yeah. To, didn't didn't bother to put the first name, so didn't um, look that up. But but yeah, so the the yeah the first the the first one is uh, yeah he puts forth these four cardinal principles. The second's an interview, and the third Frank is Frank B. A, Gibney, uh, vice right. chairman of the compilation committee of Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> what, are you, it's like, what are you just like meets guys who write encyc writes encyclopedias? And um, Paul T. K. Lin, director of the Institute of East Asia at the McGill University of Canada. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. that makes a bit more sense. But uh, anyway, these are good. These are these are good essays. Um, not not mm -hmm. I think as as kind of striking um, in terms of you know how they demarcate a transformation as the earlier ones, but very interesting. All very interesting. Mm -hmm. And and I do think maybe that interview. You know, there's a lot in that interview. He compresses a lot. It's very nice because he compresses a lot of points he makes elsewhere. Because often he really draws things out and explains them very thoroughly. He compresses a lot into a pretty tight frame. So it's a good a good summary of some of what's going on. Um, okay, so everybody, you guys, you guys good? Anything, anything you guys add before we finish? Anything else to say? I'm good. No, I just want to say by the way before we go, I'm just so you know, I'm currently working on a translation of the Introduction to the Communist Manifesto with uh, Ludovica. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm currently working on a translation of Palmiro Togliatti's Introduction to the Communist Manifesto from, 19, from 1948, uh, centen okay. Centenary Introduction. Mm -hmm. um, so he was the uh, uh, he was the longtime leader of the Italian Communist Party. who died in 1964. It's quite a quite a good text. Um, we're just uh, though we have to contact uh, we have to get a hold of the the editor, the old Italian okay. Communist Party publish, publisher who controls the rights, and we have to get them to give us permission. To put mm -hmm. it out, but hopefully, hopefully, I'll have that treat soon for uh, Zero Books Capital Comrades uh, special uh, English uh, first time in English translation of Togliatti's Italian uh, introduction to the Communist Manifesto. So that'd be cool. It's very good. Yeah, he talks about mm -hmm. it's crazy. Like when you get into like like just like Italian Marxism of that era, because like he just starts debating like papal encyclicals and stuff, and it's like, is this your theory that you guys discuss? <laughs> I would talk about Mexico. I mean, it's probably not totally yeah. different, but yeah. No, it's very similar, actually. Mm. <laughs> like in Canada, the left isn't like, oh yeah, you know, you're like theoretical critique of a papal, papal encyclical, <laughs> and like all these references to the Jesuits, and like you know, it's like the really strong uh, spiritualist, um, the 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 fight against like like spiritualism and and, and Christianity mm -hmm. is such a strong part of yeah, it. Yeah, I mean Catholicism, right? In, in case of Italy. Yeah. I mean, the papal states, are, it's, it's right there. The Pope's like... <laughs> yeah, he's like... Yeah. You, know, <laughs> he's you, the you know, you do have the slight downside of growing up in, you know, the godless Canadian wilderness. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we do, we do have, we, you know, we do have some some religious people in Canada. It's not too many where I'm from. Um, but yeah, okay, well, let's, let's log off now then. And uh, mm -hmm. thanks, thanks so much, guys. It's been an hour 45. Uh, I like, okay, bored oh, egg. Bored uh, okay. Egg, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the guy who died from lasagna, right? Thank you guys. Uh, <laughs> thank you guys so much for coming out. Uh, thanks, Timothy. Thanks, Ernesto. Uh, so we'll be back. We'll be back um, on. Uh, we'll be back on the twenty eighth. That'll be March twenty eighth at eight p.m. Um, Central European time. And what what time is that in EST? I don't want to hit that. You know, um, because it, I'm I'm afraid it's daylight savings. I think. 
Is it five it'd hours? Be three, it'd be three o'clock P, uh, EST or EDT now, and then it's uh, noon PDT because we're five hours savings time. Five hours. Okay. So so we think that'll be uh, eight o'clock uh, Eastern Central Time uh, on the 28th um, and three o'clock um, Eastern D, I don't know what the fuck D is. Eastern Standard Time, Eastern Daylight it's, Time. It's we're in yeah, daylight no, it's a, time, yeah. so it's okay. D T yeah. instead of S T. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But Facebook so, does all the work for us. It just it automatically converts into our time. Yeah, time, I just so. want to you know just want to tell people it's good, good, yeah. good, 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 good. You got to energize your base, you know, to let people know. Yeah, it's polite. Um, okay, thanks guys. This has been Conrad Hamilton, Ernesto Vargas, Timothy Schatz for Zero Books Capital Comrades, Chinese Marxism, uh, number eight. Uh, and we'll be back mm -hmm. uh, next week with number number nine, uh, continuing to blaze through Deng's 1980s writings. So have a good night, guys. Take it easy. Bye.